The 3D models in this video were made by Kuzim, or Adam Midzuk, and the animations were made by Tyler Addison. Their socials will be included in the description and the comment section below. Pterosaurs were the first group of backboned animals to evolve the ability to fly. Sure, they were beat by the invertebrates and their bizarrely efficient techniques, but pterosaurs took it in stride and became the best flippy flappies until the dinosaurs took a crack at it. I mean, pterosaurs also took the gold in being the largest things to ever fly, so birds can suck it. The pterosaurs, or flying reptiles, originated sometime in the Triassic period. They evolved from a handful of possible groups of weird archosaur or archosaur adjacent reptiles with varying degrees of hoppiness, flappiness, and warm bloodedness. Traditionally, pterosaurs were thought to have been restricted to relatively small size from the Triassic until the end of the Jurassic periods before ballooning in size due to new evolutionary adaptations in the early Cretaceous, leading to giant airmasters like Quetzalcoatlus, Pteranodon, and Thalassodromius. Those small sizes being wingspans of anything up to 1.6 meters, 5.2 feet. It was also hypothesized that this shift from small-bodied, long-tailed forms into the huge-skulled, big-bodied, short-tailed forms was due to competition with avian dinosaurs during the Cretaceous. A brand new Scottish specimen of an unusually large pterosaur from an unusually early time was just described as Yark Skianok by a team of scientists in February 2022, and it both answers and asks a whole set of questions about pterosaur evolution. All the way back in the pre-COVID times of 2017, PhD student Amelia Penny was scouting for fossils along the coast of the Isle of Skye in Scotland as part of an expedition team with the University of Edinburgh funded by the National Geographic. Penny and team were specifically at Brothers Point, looking through rocks that belong to the Lyalt Shale Formation, which dates to the Bathonian stage of the Mid-Jurassic, so about 168 to 166 million years ago. This rock is a kind of limestone that has a bunch of fossils of invertebrates throughout it, creating a sort of bread pudding or fruitcake-like texture of bioclasts connected by a limestone matrix. The limestone and bioclasts tell us that when this rock layer was being laid down, the environment that is now a cold Atlantic coastline was once a warm, lagoonal, nearshore environment. While looking for fossils at low tide, Amelia found the skull of a flying reptile peeking out of one of the huge hard layers of rock that is literally attached to the beach. Too bad it wasn't one of the mobile rounded boulders. The team had to work fast before the tide came back, so they went at the rock around the fossil with diamond-tipped saws to chunk it up and take it out. The team almost lost the fossil as they had to stop cutting as the tide came in. They'd run out of time. After worrying about the state of the now slightly fresher fossil in the briny waves, the team went back to collect it at nearly midnight. Thankfully, they found that nothing had happened to it and brought it back to the university intact. Once back at the university, they were able to chip a lot more of that limestone off the bones to get a better look at them. All told, what they had found was a rather complete skeleton of a medium-sized pterosaur. This skeleton is the largest and most complete found in Scotland, and is reportedly the best British skeleton found since the days of Mary Anning back in the early 1800s. The skeleton consists of most of the torso, the base of the tail, chunks of the pelvis and shoulder girdle, the humerus, parts of the radius and ulna, the hands, and bits of the wing, most of the neck minus the neural arches, and the entire skull minus the very top. In fact, the fossil looks like it got a buzz cut a little too close, and the entire top of the skull got sheared off along with all the fragile parts of the vertebrae. That's definitely due to erosion, since the top of the fossil was the part sticking out of the rock. Once all these bones were described, the research team decided to name it Yark Skianok. Yark comes from Gaelic for winged reptile, and Skianok for the Isle of Skye or winged isle. 
Not so sure on giving it such a hard to pronounce name, but who am I to judge? This three-dimensionally preserved skeleton belonged to a rather large pterosaur, as I've alluded to. In order to get a good body estimate, you need a good wingspan. York doesn't have enough bones to give a perfect wingspan estimate since it's missing some bones here and there. As such, the research team were able to come up with a few different wingspan scenarios depending on different metrics. To get a wingspan estimate, the team compiled the complete wingspan measurements of two other pterosaurs, Ramphorhynchus and Dorignathus, and then did some math stuff that gave them an equation they could use for Yark. Let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get a good comparison with this new pterosaur. Using Ramphorhynchus estimates and the skull and humerus lengths of Yark, this specimen of Yark may have had a wingspan of 2.2 to 3.8 meters, 7.2 to 12.4 feet. Using the Dorignathus estimates and the humerus length of Yark, the wingspan was about 1.9 meters, 6.2 feet. Thanks, Mr. Man. These estimations all make Yark the largest Jurassic period pterosaur yet known. This also lines up with its head and humerus being the longest of any Jurassic pterosaur as well. The research team suggests that the larger wingspan estimates given from using Ramphorhynchus are the more valid estimates because Ramphorhynchus is more closely related to Yark than is Dorignathus. On top of that, Ramphorhynchus is now known from a huge sample size of tens of dozens of specimens, ranging in size and age, which gives a good idea of how they changed as they aged. Turns out, Yark was still growing when it died. The team figured that out by cutting a slice out of a wing bone and placing it under the microscope to see how many growth rings there were. Yark was therefore an actively growing juvenile to subadult when it died. This means that the genus and species probably got bigger once fully grown, making a larger wingspan estimate a more valid one. Though it is related to Ramphorhynchus and Dorignathus, these were not its closest relatives. Yark most likely belongs to its own new clade the research team described in the new paper as Angustina ripterini. This group includes Yark, but also the namesake Chinese Angustina ripterus and Ceracipterus. These guys, minus Yark, were rather large, already being just a little larger than the majority of known Jurassic pterosaurs. So Yark isn't the most out of left field entry to this group, but it is still real big. The group is now known for a rather large opening before the eye socket, reclined quadrate bone, and proportionally long neck vertebrae in this front part of the neck. Aside from the more technical similarities, they also have similarly long snoots brimming with out and down projecting needle teeth, starting out small and then ending as super long fangs at the front with all of them interlocking. They likely all had a long tail, ending in a fleshy, muscly, cartilaginous vein tip, as well as large, rounded, rectangular wings and short hind limbs. With all that anatomy and all that size, what was Yark doing? It had a similar dental toolkit to Ramphorhynchus, as well as its close relatives. This claptrap has been hypothesized to act as a snag for fish, squids, and other soft-bodied sea creatures. Since these pterosaurs were found in sediments that were once the bottom of warm shallow coastal and lagoonal areas, they've been suggested to be somewhat of a Mesozoic equivalent of gulls and other seabirds. This does match up with what is known of their biology. They are more adapted for soaring over sea winds than swiftly flitting through dense trees, climbing bark, or running down land prey. Not that they were incapable, of course. Since Yark was larger than any contemporary pterosaurs, some have likened it to the sea eagle, to the Ramphorhynchus' seagull comparison. In that case, it may have been more adapted for larger prey items, but those teeth still strongly suggest a diet of slippery or soft-bodied prey. They aren't good for fighting large prey items. Natalia Yalgieska, the lead author of the Yark paper, showed off a 3D print of the skull of Yark on Twitter. This was made based off a 3D scan of the beast's noggin when the team threw the thing in a micro-CT scanner, which also revealed the animal's endocast. 
Endocast being the empty space in the brain case where the brain used to be. Fill in that space and what do you got? A good approximation of the brain and ear canals of the beast. It's not entirely distinct from the known endocast of Rampharynchus, so its senses were probably not too different. Yark's size and time frame suggest something more intriguing about pterosaur evolution, that perhaps the pterosaurs were reaching much larger sizes earlier than historically thought. Pterosaur bones are notoriously bad at fossilizing. They are long, skinny, and hollow. Most pterosaurs were not the absolute largest, so once they died they were torn apart by other animals, their bones scattered from their skeletons, and then crushed or eroded by time. On top of that, pterosaurs had the freedom to fly over every single piece of terrain that was the opposite of conducive to fossilization. This has created many biases in the understanding of pterosaur evolution. Usually this discussion revolves around the origins of the pterosaurs, how they conquered the skies, and who they came from. But other discussions are to be had on the many blank gaps in the evolution of fully-fledged pterosaurs. The Middle Jurassic is a big gap in pterosaur evolution, as not many are known from this time. Not many are known from early and late Jurassic times either, but much more than the middle. Yark is the earliest known big pterosaur and pushes the hypotheses of how big these things could get back many tens of millions of years. I have a sneaking suspicion that pterosaurs could reach much larger sizes than seabird wingspan for a much larger chunk of time. So I won't be surprised if giant Triassic and early Jurassic flying reptiles are found someday. The research team even alludes to a few tantalizing pterosaur specimens that suggest similar large sizes to Yark, and perhaps even larger. However, these specimens are extremely fragmentary and don't tell you much. There are two hypotheses on why pterosaurs got so large only in the Cretaceous. One is that advances in the body plans of pterosaurs allowed for the evolution of bigger, better, more efficient sizes. The other is that they got big to size out of competition with birds, which began to diversify in the Cretaceous. These hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. The discovery of Yark and consideration of large fragmentary mystery pterosaur fossils suggests that they could get much larger than the bird ecology before birds had even evolved. There could have been entire ghost lineages of bird-like non-bird theropods during the Jurassic that left no record, but this shows the pterosaurs were under different pressures to reach certain large sizes over various chunks of geologic time. Of course, it's more complicated than a simple hypothesis or two. Only more pterosaurs from the Jurassic will be able to broaden the answers to the many questions still lingering about the evolutionary trajectories of the world's first backboned flyers. Yark merch is now available on the Edge Redbubble. Support my artists and I via links in the description and comment section below. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks goes to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.